In this video, we're going to talk about how psychologists use the scientific method to develop theories and hypotheses in hope of explaining human behavior. In my previous video, we talked about how common sense and intuition might not be as reliable as you once thought. Now, does that mean psychologists don't like people who have hunches or plausible sounding theories? No. Psychologists and scientists as a whole encourage people to have a curious mindset because it propels the field forward with new ideas. But when all these new ideas are coming in at once, it can get disorganized pretty quickly and it becomes difficult to communicate them to other professionals. This is where the scientific method comes in. It's an organizational and self-correcting process for evaluating ideas with observation and analysis. It helps organize the data through a set of rules that everyone can follow, and it self-corrects because it's constantly building on new ideas that come in all the time. Now it's important to define the terms under the scientific method, because while we might use them in everyday conversation, they tend to mean something else in psychology. Whenever you say a theory, you're probably using it in a situation where you mean a hunch. Like, I wonder who took the last of the honey Dijon kettle chips, Steve. But in psychology, a theory organizes observations, it explains principles, and it predicts behaviors or events. So let's use an example to illustrate the scientific method. Let's say we came up with a theory that sleep deprivation has an effect on memory retention. Maybe we observe that people with good sleep habits tend to answer questions more accurately in class, and they do better during test time. Based on this list of observations, we might theorize that sleep improves memory. Yet no matter how reasonable this theory might sound, we have to put it to the test. And any good theory produces testable predictions called hypotheses. These predictions enable us to specify what results would support the theory and what results would disconfirm it. Now a hypothesis is usually in the form of a statement, something you predict will happen when testing, in our memory example, a good hypothesis might be sleep-deprived individuals will remember less from the day before. In order to test this hypothesis, you would probably give study materials to two different groups. One group with enough sleep, and then one group with a short night's sleep, and then test their memory the next day. Now in a future video, we will discuss in depth what happens during experiments, but for now, let's concentrate on the important concepts of the scientific method. When psychologists test their hypotheses and theories, they can often have a bias that may cloud their judgment. When you're looking so hard for what you expected, such as faulty memory, you might perceive sleepy people's comments as less insightful. In order to put checks on the biases, psychologists have to report their research with precise operational definitions. These are carefully defined variables that everyone can agree on. What is sleep loss? Is it two hours less than one's natural cycle, or three? And what about a good memory score? Is it the average for their age, or what they scored previously? By carefully wording your statements, you can communicate to other researchers the exact situation, and they in turn can replicate or repeat the study using different participants, materials, or circumstances. By replicating one's observations, researchers can decide whether the basic findings extend to other participants or situations. This is called reliability, or the chance that you will get similar results from multiple testings. Another method for determining if your test is a good one is called validity. This is the confidence that your test is actually testing what you say it is. Like if your participants were denied sleep and food the previous night, then who's to say that your test is measuring sleep deprivation or hunger's effects on memory? Overall, a theory will be useful if it A, organizes observations and reports, and B, implies predictions that anyone can use to check the theory. But theories are subject to change. Eventually your research might lead to a revised theory that better predicts or organizes what you know. That's the beauty of the scientific method and its self-correcting process. In this video, we discussed how psychologists use the scientific method. We talked about how a good theory explains principles and predicts behaviors. We also talked about how a hypothesis is used to test a theory. And finally, we examine how biases occur and why operational definitions and replication are so important. Thank you for watching. Be sure to check out my other Psychology 101 videos, and keep a lookout for future videos in which we look into the different methods we use to test hypotheses and refine our theories. Now, if you excuse me, I'm going to get some more kettle chips.